Howdy folks, and welcome to Madera Canyon, Arizona, just a tad north of the Mexican border. Sharon and I have been coming here for over 40 years. Why? Birds. Specifically, hummingbirds. East of Mississippi, you have just one species, the ruby-throated. You go west, you have a whole lot more. And then you go southwest, you've got even more. I mean, just this week alone, we've photographed eight species of hummingbirds. It's just an incredible place for these little flying jewels that, well, I want to entice you to come. Now, hummingbirds, they got their name because the sound of their wings when they fly. Hum. That's why you'll hear me call them hummers the entire time. Uh, I have such an affinity for these guys. That's why I keep coming out and photographing them. And I have all my feeders I do back at the ranch. Now, photographing them, as you might imagine, takes some biology, a bit of technology, and then, of course, a bit of shooting strategy to make the photographs happen. So let's just explore that, see if I can't entice you to come down to the border. All right, let's talk a little bit about biology. Now, hummingbirds, they're just in a fascinating, fascinating bit of evolution. You know, you've got these wings... Average wing beat of most, most North American hummingbirds is 50 beats a second, right? So how many beats is that a minute? <laughs> My arms get tired of thinking about it. That tongue, it's a forked tongue. It actually, it starts in one part of the skull, goes all the way back and wraps around, comes out that mandible. It goes in and out 10 to 15 times per second because these little guys, these dynamos, drink, eat, however you want to look at it, half their body weight each day of sugar slash nectar. Now, yeah, they only weigh about a nickel. They're not really like heavyweights. But think about it. How, how much would you have to consume? To, <laughs> yeah, 50% of your body weight each day. That's what these guys are doing. It's amazing. And then there's those heartbeats, right? 1,200 times, up to 4,000 times per minute, depending on where you're looking at what's you know, new world species of hummingbird. <laughs> so it is that energy that we want to photograph. Now at night, they go in what's called torpor. They go to sleep. Now heart rates go down to just, you know, 10, 20, depending on the species, per uh, 30 beats per, per minute. You know, they go way down. Sun comes up, they crank up that heart and energy and away they go. Now, the reason why we're here at Madera Canyon is because this is a canyon that runs east to west. As I mentioned, it's just above the, the Mexican border. So we have a lot of Mexican species that come up. And we have a lot of North American species here. Uh, you know, we've got everything. You'll see them in the background. I'm sure the, the big uh, rivoli or the blue throat, that's the big hummer, okay? That's about that big. And then we go down to small ones. We have acostas that are about this big. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you come here, you can see some real rarities, like the bear line, which is the smallest one you'll see here in North America, the plain cap star throat. There's some really amazing hummers that come here. The most prevalent one here is the broadbill, which photographically is really cool because it's the one that's got every color you can imagine in the rainbow and a few extra thrown in. I mean, it's just it's an incredible looking bird. Now, they're, they're darting around. They're busy feeding. And we have set up a shooting gallery. We're taking advantage of that need for 50% of their body weight. And we're going to give it to them. But there's very special nectar that's mixed up. Now, the feeders themselves have no food coloring. They don't need that. In fact, it actually can cause a cancer around their mandibles. So you don't need for food coloring to attract a hummingbird. It's a very simple formula. Four parts water, one part sugar. This particular uh, recipe they're using here has got some other proteins and enzymes and stuff that actually gives them some, you could say, more juice for their lick. And it's just a marvelous situation. Now, you could say this is very much an artificial scenario because what have we got going? We have got all these feeders attracting all these hummingbirds. That increases your shooting time, and that's really important because otherwise you could be here for a long time before you even go click. So that's the basic biology you need to understand. Wing beats going really fast. They got their name from the sound of their wing beats, hum. And that kind of 
all sets up how I go about photograph him. So let's talk a little bit about technology. You're probably saying, well, there's that big rig again. And uh, it is a big rig. Understand that in my 40 years of coming here, I've shot everything with a 7300 or 7200. I've shot with 300s. I've shot with the gear that I had at the time. You can make it work. What you're seeing now, as far as I'm concerned, puts so much fun into it. That's really why I have the gear I have, but you can use anything. The important thing is you understand the logic behind it to get the shot. So just a quick run through. What I've got is I've got the D6. I've got the 180-400, and depending on which feeder, I'm going to either engage or disengage the 1.4, which I'm shooting at either 400 millimeter or 560 millimeter. I have two SB5000s. They're connected to SD9 batteries, okay? And I have the impact uh, quickbacks macro light diffusers. Now this whole setup is based on, on a couple of things and you need to understand that before we move forward. The final photograph I'm taking, I don't want the wings frozen. And there is no right or wrong to this. It's all to your personal preference, the way you want to express the magic of flight that hummingbirds present us. And since their name is based on that sound of that wing, that hum, I want you to see that in my still images. So this whole rig is based on having a tack sharp eye and body and out of focus or blurred wings from the motion of them actually flying. I mean, this is the only bird that can fly backwards. These are a marvel of flight, 50 beats per second. I mean, it's staggering. So with that in mind, what I have is not a TTL system. I'm using manual ratios. And why is that? So bear with me a second. You're gonna wanna get a sharp picture, but you don't want ghosting. Ghosting happens a lot. And what is ghosting? Well, the average ratio that I'm using here on the SB5000 is about 1 16th, sometimes 1 32nd. It's all gonna be based on the light. We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Now that ratio gives me, if we were to put that burst of light into shutter speed terms. And we're all doing that so we have a kind of a point of reference. You know, you're talking about a shutter speed from this at around 20 thousandths of a second, something less. That's one 20 thousandths of a second. Now, what's the fastest shutter speed you can get out of the camera? Eight thousandths. So a 20 thousandths so is actually going to freeze the motion of the hummingbird. But because I'm using a slower shutter speed, Average shutter speed about 400 to 500, 600 to the second. The wings will blur. They're not being frozen by the flash burst, only the body. Now that combination is how I'm getting the shot. And the two flashes are here because of a simple thing. Angle of incident equals angle of reflection. The body of the hummingbird is curved. The gorget, and that's his throat area that really lights up with some species is also curved. So to get that to all light up in this photograph, I need to kind of wrap light around that hummingbird, which is why the two lights are as you see them right here, okay? Now, because they're on a bracket, as I move this around to, to shoot, the lights are always pointed at the same spot. That's my point of focus. So I'm wrapping that light around and I get to sit here and it's a total mobile system allowing me to photograph as I want different hummingbirds based on the background. Now, the technology is very cool. And this is what's, you know, the D6, the Z bodies. You know, by simply pushing one button, the I button, the menu comes up, I can touch the group and I can come over here very quickly. I can change the uh, ratio or the power that I want based on the light. And that speed is really important because these guys are buzzing around and you're trying to photograph them and use this technology to do what? Take your mind off technology and taking pictures. Because as you'll find out, once you get them in the viewfinder, that's when the real challenge begins. So you don't want it here. 
Now, what else about the system? Why do I have external battery packs, for example? Well, I'm running everything off the AA batteries, rechargeables. In the SD9s, you've got you know, kind of a two-prong attack. You've got four AA batteries in the flash, and when this is plugged into the front, those four batteries are basically running the computer, taking care of stuff like that, and giving some of their energy to the capacitors. The SD9s are a direct source to the capacitor. What does that really translate to in photography? It means you can see here and blast away, and you're going to have the same power coming out of that flash. That same power means the same exposure. It's a consistent light. That's really important. Uh, like a lot of different things, like in my nut hatch video that I did, you know, that burst with hummingbirds is about 14, 16 is about, that's a really good long burst. You usually don't get that. You usually get four or five before they're gone. So this simple mobile power source allows you to be very, very concise, very consistent, beautiful wraparound light with these big boxes making the photography worthwhile. Now, what if you don't have this system? I want you to use the same basic logic. Perhaps use one flash. Perhaps just one light modifier. Put it to the side. Use the sun, okay, as a means of one part of that two light approach and use that flash and use the flash not to overpower the sun, but maybe be just a half a stop less. That's a way to start out. What if you don't have a long lens? Use a shorter lens and then use the biology to get in close physically. Something about biology I want to touch on at this point. So hummingbirds remember every flower they've ever gotten nectar from. That's pretty cool. More to the point though, they remember the people who bring out their feeders and fill them. Okay, so if you are the one who is grabbing that feeder and bringing it out and filling it, and they see you, they remember you. Why is that important? Don't have a long lens? If you're the one that brings out their food, they're going to let you get closer. There's going to be a trust there. It's just basic biology you can use with your technology to get the shot. So let's talk about the actual shooting process. So I want to talk a little bit about technology when it comes to shooting before I go any further. Focus is really important. Autofocus can make a big difference. You have to understand how it works though to maximize its ability for your photograph. I'm out there shooting with a D6. I'm using the 15 by 3 my C2 autofocus mode. It does a great job, but you have to understand how it's working to make it work for you. So if you're sitting here panning, okay, to keep that hummingbird inside your viewfinder, keep in mind that right off the bat, the autofocus is going to say, okay, you're moving, looking for that movement. It's got to lock on to a moving subject that's moving very fast, very erratically, as you're moving. That combination sometimes is going to cause the autofocus to delay in grabbing on. And as you'll find out, you know, one of the incredible challenges and frustration, which also makes this so much fun, is you're going to take pictures and you're going to swear there was a hummingbird there when you went click. And you look at the picture and all you see is nothing. I get that a lot. I don't know anybody who shoots these who doesn't get that a lot. That's part of the fun. You gotta understand, if you don't have a hummingbird in there when you go click, how can the autofocus grab onto it? Strategy then, with that in mind. You have a hummingbird feeder. There's a, from where you're sitting or standing. And you gotta understand that in this process, you need to be like this the entire time. If you lean back, and then you lean forward, two things, one, this motion of you coming forward could take a shy hummingbird, center it away. Two, by the time you come up to do this from leaning back, it's too late. So you want to be ready to go and shoot. That means I've got my finger on the shutter release. I have my back focus as the uh, doing the autofocus operation. So the camera is going to be active. I've got it halfway depressed. And then I'm going to press that 
AF on button as the Hummer comes into the viewfinder. And then I've got the camera set to focus plus release in the custom setting menu. So it won't take a picture until it says it's in sub, uh, subjects in focus. With all that in mind, looking towards that feeder, you have our left side and our right side. Now, if you look at the feeders, and here's a, you can see all five of them here. You can see I've got a light stand, a Justin clamp, a green rod thingy from the, the nursery. I have what's called a uh, keep away, and that is a little cup that has water in it so the ants don't get down into the feeder because that will eat, the bees won't drive the hummingbirds away, but the ants will. And then there's the actual feeder. I can take these feeders and move them anywhere I want. And why do I want that? Because the background. The background is everything. The further the background can be away from that feeder, the better. If you've got a bright background, you can move the feeder to a darker background, even better. My basic exposure, I'm shooting at f8. I want a shutter speed, the very slowest, is 125. I'm in aperture priority. So I'm going to often change my ISO, don't have a choice, but it's a luxury we have, so I'm going to take advantage of it, to get a faster shutter speed to avoid that ghosting. Ghosting is where you, you flash freezes a subject, but the subject still moves during the exposure, like in this example. I don't want to have that, so I'm on a faster shutter speed. So my typical ISO here at Madeira, and I have two sessions. I shoot in the morning, I shoot in the evening. It's about 1600 ISO. Now, when it comes to the actual getting the shot, if I am photographing the right side of the feeder, so the camera is concentrated on that little alleyway, I'm going to put the actual feeder in the lower left-hand corner of the frame. If I'm shooting the left side of the hummingbird feeder, I'm going to put the feeder in just a very small corner of the right-hand side of the frame. Now, hummingbirds, they, they, they go er, er, like this. I don't want to shot the feeder. So what I'm going to do is I, I focus on that little corner, and then I move the lens just a tad so the feeder's out of the frame, and then I wait for them to come in and out. And I see them come in, hit the AF on button, locks on, I take the shot. Now there's some really amazing possibilities here. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I have ideas of photographs I want, I've still not got. That, that's one reason I'm still here 40 years. I would still love the shot of the two hummingbirds intently going, because if you've ever spent any time in a hummingbird feeder, you've always seen that one dominant male that says, this is my feeder. I want the shot of the two of those guys going at it. I love some shots to see them actually going backwards. They change the rotation of their wing. When they go backwards, I love that look to them. And while I've got some really favorite shots of hummingbirds, I know I can do better. And this is the basis of the biology, the technology, and the shooting techniques that I keep working on to get that better photograph. And I hope it helps you, inspires you to come out and photograph hummers, because these flying jewels, I think are one of the funnest things to photograph in wildlife photography.